I've been part of UniFood Day since this morning. But also welcome to those of you who are checking in just now because you are interested in uh, staying ahead and knowing what kind of food science is going on. Indeed, this is where this happens. Uh, you have checked in for the third session of the day. Uh, we've had two uh, multinationals already presenting their problems or questions this morning. Uh, we had Nestle talking about precision fermentation and uh, in a special focus on dairy proteins. We've discussed uh, off flavors and plant foods with IFF and some wonderful uh, hand-picked scientists. But now I am uh, more than pleased to uh, welcome you to the third session. Now we, we have the honor of having uh, Mikael Simonsen, the director of uh, new food from Tetra Pak Processing with us, directly from Sweden. Um, and uh, he will introduce the question or the considerations that Tetra Pak are doing on a specific topic. After this, we are lucky enough to have Anne-Christine Stinker Hestrup, who is the director um, at the, the Danish Technological Institute, Professor Marianne Thompson from University of Copenhagen, as well as uh, senior researcher Mikulai Ovsianiak from uh, DTU. Um, welcome to all of you and welcome to all the audience. Um, I think it's perhaps a good idea to repeat that I am sending out all the presentations after now. But some of the speakers are bringing some knowledge today that will not be sent around. So do stay attentive because what you hear now will stay in the room. Um, and uh, it's uh, my pleasure also to give to open the floor for questions, which will be taken up by my colleague Louise sitting here next to me. And uh, we will take up the questions we have time for in the discussion session after having heard all the four speakers introduce uh, their presentations. Thank you so much uh, for now. I will uh, change so that we can see uh, the presentation by you, Mikael Tetapak. And uh, I will hand over the, mic the, the, the cursor for you, Michael, as soon as your, um, it's a little bit, Annoying, I see. I don't know what's what's not really what I I thought. It's not like I want it to be. Let me see if I can share. Maybe I should stop there and see if I can find the right presentation. It should be here. Hopefully, everybody can see it, and I know they can. And uh, here we go. Michael, the floor is yours, and the microphone is yours. Thanks a lot, Heidi. Uh, my name is Mikael Simonsson. I'm responsible for, we say, the future food of Tetra Pak, but also all the R&D within the processing area of Tetra Pak. Uh, I normally joke a little bit because I've been working 29 years in Tetra Pak, uh, but I don't know anything about packages. Uh, but I know quite a lot about how to process in food, so converting raw material into food. Uh, but I will give you first a little brief idea about Tetra Pak. So very short introduction from that point of view. Ah, how do I flip? No, I didn't know how to do that. So I got the cursor, and now it comes. Oh, sorry. Uh, Tetra pack consists of uh, three different legs. The one part is the processing. It is actually the, to convert the food, the raw material into food. So those kind of machines. And the basic in this one for us is very much about the food application knowledge. Uh, the second leg, and the, of course, the biggest one is the packaging. This is the, the core of a tetra pack from that point of view. So everything around to, to have, so, yeah, package food in a good way so you can distribute it and have it preserved in a very, very good way. Added into this one is, is of course, the services. So the service business is going around both processing and packaging. So then when we hand over the equipment to the, our customers. But those are the three legs, very brief. But as I said, I only know more or less the processing. Uh, I have very good colleagues in packaging and services uh, you could talk to. Uh, core technologies, when you come to the processing area, it is, is very much about killing. I would say like that. It is about pasteurization, due treatment, or microorganisms. So actually to remove, or not remove, but actually deactivate them. 
It is very much blending and mixing and dosing. It is about separation and standardization. And then, of course, as well, homogenization, but also bioreactors, sugar dissolving, carbonization, curd making of any kind, aseptic buffering, etc. Uh, very much coming in also when you have everything around powder handling and those chemical systems, so evaporation and those parts. So those are the main core technologies we're working with very deep in processing. But then, of course, other one as well. The categories we're working in is everything from dairy, so everyone from milk, cream, etc. Very much in ice cream as well. So I think there's 70 percent chances that have been through or freezes if you eat an ice cream somewhere in the world. Uh, beverage is actually everything what we call that you could drink not contain too much milk. So juice, nectar, still drink, carbonated soft drink, coffee, tea, water, or whatsoever. Prepared food is a little bit more what you're eating with a spoon. So a little bit thicker products from that point of view, soap sauces, et cetera. And then cheese, cream cheese, hard cheese, semi-hard cheese, et cetera. And then the powder, and then the newest categories into that one is, of course, plant-based. But the one I want to talk a little bit more about is what we call new food. New food is what we call biotech food from that area. Uh, how we want to work in this field is very much, and now we come back for the most of the newest areas. It is very, very much about partnerships, how actually we uh, collaborate and then drive the business together. Uh, because we see when they have new categories coming in and new food in, in the area, we really see the importance of collaborating with, for example, with Lund University, but also did you, Wacheningen, and uh, universities in Israel, etc. Uh, we also work very much, or try to work very much at least, with incubators. So you have the first start, you have food and biotech cluster, we have Kinova in Sweden, etc. And as well with investors, uh, because Tetra Pak, we, we don't invest in companies, uh, but we actually can endorse startups that we want or need, so to say. So we try to be as ambassador and connect people. And then coming back to recipe development, strain development is something else, but recipe development, a little bit of, of making food and make support of actually make good and tasteful products. And then of course, scale up facilities. We have our own and we're also building up new things in, in, in that area, but really to build up pilot plants, et cetera, and so on, to so have customers coming here and startups to test out the product in how we should work. And then of course, as well, work very much with free party suppliers, uh, but also another part I'm quite uh, proud of is actually working with the United Nations a little bit of how to make food more accessible for the planet. So this is a little bit of our overview of the partnership, how we want to work in the partnership area. Uh, what you see in the challenge in front of us, uh, go into the biotech food. It is coming from the pharmaceutical area with a very high uh, value but low volume. Now we need to take it to food with a low value but high volume. And here we have a challenge to come into this one. Uh, so the challenge and the questions you have for the panel today is when we come to precision fermentation. Uh, we really see precision fermentation as one of the core area for the future. But at the same time, uh, we really see it provides huge waste streams. Actually around 95% go to waste. Uh, and only 5% are proteins or fat that we could use. So the question is, how could we make sure that this whole new food production system is actually sustainable? So looking into the substrate, looking into the waste streams and looking into the different parts of yield. So that was my introduction idea. Wow, thank you so much, Michael. Going from high value, low amount to low value, large quantities. Was that what you said? Something like that. It's a nice yeah. way of putting it. And how can we make that sustainable? Wow. Uh, luckily, Michael, I've been uh, uh, a couple of really good scientists have uh, signed up uh, to take up the challenge and try to perspectivate your question. Um, and uh, 
the first one that I'll give hand over the microphone to is uh, Anne Christine from the uh, Technologisk Institute or a Danish Technological Institute. You are the director of the, the Center for Bioresources uh, and you hold a PhD in microbiology from the University of Copenhagen, but you're now focusing on biotechnologies, both in the research and uh, in the scalability of uh, applied solutions. And I know that you will take us through uh, a couple of definitions of what is actually position fermentation. So, and to um, to perspect to give some little a perspective to what Michael is explaining to us uh, is a problem here. Um, right, and here is your presentation. And I hand over the control to you, Anna Christina. In case there are any problems, I can help you and take over again. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, and thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Michael, for the good introduction. So, uh, yeah, I will uh, be presenting uh, some of the, the, hopefully, some of the challenges and, and some of the things that we need to keep in mind to, uh, to address uh, Michael's uh, issue about how can we make it more uh, sustainable in, in many different ways. Um, I've been working with bioprocessing for the past uh, 15 years a lot on, on biorefining and now biosolutions and, and fermentation is, is definitely picking up. And, and my question is the same as You mine. click once and then it should work. Yeah. So in the fermentation area, we have uh, basically three different types of fermentation. There's the traditional fermentation, biomass fermentation, and then precision fermentation. So the traditional fermentation is the one that we know from many of the products that Michael also presented, uh, where we use a, a microorganism to, uh, to convert uh, a product into to new types of, of uh, food products, such as yogurt, cheese, and so on. So uh, <clears throat> that's both uh, using microorganisms such as yeast and, and fungi and, and bacteria. Then we have the, the biomass fermentation. And, and here we are looking into how can we uh, make new types of, of proteins? How can uh, we use, for instance, fungal mycelium uh, uh, cultivated in a tank as a new product? So uh, here we're using the entire biomass, uh, which is, is being fermented in a new way. So that's a good way of, of producing alternative proteins. Um, but it can also be used uh, directly uh, as an ingredient. <clears throat> so in, in this one, it's uh, uh, less processing, uh, less purification in what we are seeing in the... There we go, let's see. If uh, we are seeing in the precision fermentation area. <clears throat> so precision fermentation is what we also know from the, the pharma industry. Uh, it's a microbial production of very specific compounds. So, uh, so as Michael said, it's a, a way of producing something where potentially very little currently is used as the, the main product that we're looking for. So a lot of times it's using microbes that have been reprogrammed into making uh, specific uh, enzymes, uh, proteins, uh, antioxidants, ingredients, and so on. And it's a produced in a, in a strictly controlled setting. So with the parameters such as uh, uh, oxygen and uh, nutrients and, and stirring and all of these things are, are very spe specific to this type of uh, production. So that also makes it a, a very costly production. It requires uh, oftentimes uh, more industrial, uh, the, uh, costly uh, instruments and in facilities than the two other types of fermentation that we have just presented. So, uh, but on the other hand, um, it's also a way of producing new products in a new way. It's a way of producing compounds that can uh, make new uh, taste experience, uh, new textures, uh, it's a, it's a way of producing uh, novel food ingredients such as uh, plant-based team protein, which can optimize some of the, the taste experience that we heard about in the, in the other session. 
And some of the advantages is that we can look into uh, potential production of, uh, of food that can address the, the food security and uh, help in uh, producing global nutrients. So it's a, a way of making new products, uh, both primary products, but there potentially could also be a production of, of new side streams that could be interesting. This production method could substitute some other compounds which could, do, could reduce the environmental impact in the production phase by minimizing the land use and the water consumption, and also reduce the need for chemical inputs, for instance, in the, in the production phase. So it gives a lot of new uh, business opportunities. When we look deeper into the precision fermentation, um, the, the processing involves an, an upstream phase and a downstream phase. So during the upstream phase, uh, there's a cultivation of the microorganisms um, where we had, have a, a raw material that is being, being produced uh, in these uh, fermentation reactors. And then it goes into a downstream phase where the compounds are extracted and purified, and then it can be in, uh, it can enter into a, a new formulation. So each of these steps uh, have uh, some challenges and some uh, areas of uh, optimization that uh, can help in the production cost. One of the things uh, that is most currently used uh, right now is uh, for the media area that's uh, refined sugars, but here there could be a potential for, for looking into alternative growth medias, which could, could substitute uh, refined sugar. As Michael also said, there's a huge waste stream that we also need to address when producing these compounds. How can these be produce, used in another way? Then there are the production costs, both in the upstream phase and the downstream phase. Then there are the whole regulatory and, and safety considerations. And then there are also some ethical and, and so, so, societal implications. Uh, as I said, some of these compounds are produced by, uh, by mo modified organisms. But for the next uh, few minutes, I will address uh, these potentially up to 95% loss, which is in the, in the production phase. Um, that number is of course changing a lot uh, depending on what compound we're looking for and what production organism it is, but um, it's definitely for certain that there is a large side stream here. So uh, in order to, uh, to make sure that we uh, have a, a better cost profile of this production, we definitely look into the, the waste stream production. But there's, as you can see here, there's multiple areas to look into this. The, as I said, the upstream media recycling during the production, uh, are we, uh, can we make sure that that is uh, done in a way so we can either recycle it directly into the same uh, production or use it for, for an alternative production? There uh, need to be improvements in terms of the downstream yield when we are doing the, the fractionation and separation and purification. Then the whole uh, control system uh, in, in terms of the production. Also uh, novel growth strategies, uh, the, the strains that we are looking into in production organisms. Uh, and in terms of innovation of the whole bio process design, uh, can we go, can we make sure that the, the facilities and, and this can be done in a way that is more economically feasibly produced, uh, again, to reduce the cost? And how can we uh, make use of the side streams directly, potentially as a, a co-production towards a more zero waste design where we do a, a co-cultivation uh, by other production systems. So valorizing the side streams directly as a, a feedstock for, for coke production. If, I, if we're diving further into just one of these areas, uh, for instance, the downstream processing, there are different, uh, again, areas to, to optimize. Uh, there's uh, each of the, the different unit operations that can be uh, 
can be optimized further in order to uh, increase the, the yield and the potential and reduce the cost uh, in terms of when we're looking at both extraction, fractionation, separation, concentrating and drying phase. Uh, there's different examples here of different uh, unit operations that each can, can be optimized. So there's multiple small, uh, small things that can, uh, can, be, can be modified and optimized. And, and what, that is one of the challenges here that is not forced one place to, to, uh, to do where we can do most of the tuning. It's, it's many different and many different steps and, and, and many different fine tunings. And then that's one of the things that we are, are trying also to assist with here at DTI, where we have the Biosolutions Technology Center, where we are looking into uh, helping the companies in both the developing and scaling phase of these new innovative bioprocessing technologies, um, because it's it's quite tricky to uh, to look uh, to kind of solve the whole thing uh, in one step. It's it's multiple uh, different areas that needs to be uh, to modify to reach a, a, a cost efficient process um, and reduce the, the waste stream to an optimum. So Michael was also talking about this whole scaling phase, which is very important. And why is it so important? Um, it is a matter of making sure that the processes that we have found in, in the lab phase, that they can uh, be upscale and, and validated. And we can it's do, use it to, of course, uh, make, uh, make a proof of principle of the ideas, proof of concept of the processes, develop prototypes, which is also important when we, the companies uh, have a new product that needs to be uh, presented to the market that the consumers are, are ready to, to take it on, that we can produce enough quantities of material for testing and have data for techno-economic as well as uh, business case uh, uh, and LCA uh, modeling, which Mayana will come into in the next presentation. So uh, thank you very much for, for listening in. Thank you so much, uh, Anne Christine. I think you are adding to complexity. I'll see if I can uh, take over the control here. Uh, right. Uh, thank you so much. You're adding uh, more levels of complexity to Michael's questions. Uh, I will um, leave my questions to the, the session and the discussion. Uh, but if there are any uh, clarifying questions to the presentation, I'm happy to take them now. But I think it was rather clear. Yeah. Nobody seems to have questions that you want to ask right now. Then I think we should uh, move ahead and uh, get to a bit of the, the bigger picture of how does this fit in to the overall uh, food production um, as, as just one option for um, producing food. And now we will hear Mayena Thompson. You are a professor of sustainability assessment and Sustainable Food Processing and Production at the Department of Food Science at the University of Copenhagen. And um, some of you may have heard Marianne from the media, and we know that Marianne focuses on system levels, life cycle assessment, and that supports the design of restorative and regenerative food systems to sustain ecosystem and human health. I think I should hand over the control to you, Marianne, and yeah, thank you, Heidi. Uh, I'm wondering why I have this pen. I let's see if it works. So thanks for the nice presentation or introduction. No. No. Mayen, you know you can ask me to uh, to yeah, please please. I think you should take over because right now I see myself in a big picture. <laughs> we see the presentation nice and easy. Okay, super. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, the bigger picture here, <clears throat> what is actually uh, sustainable uh, food processing and what should we expect uh, from such uh, competition implementation in this aspect. So, in general, if we start sustainable food production and processing, uh, technologies would provide, as we have heard earlier today, a good 
and tasty and nutritional, adequate, safe and healthy diets for us while being protected and respected, uh, respectful of, of biodiversity and ecosystems. Can you go to the next slide? Yeah, <laughs> so this would uh, imply that we change something or correct something uh, in terms of the existing food system. Um, being protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystem would imply that we also respect the carrying capacity, which is currently not the situation. So somehow we need to move these, uh, the food system, or the economic activities that constitutes the food system inside the safe operating space, inside the ecological ceiling, um, so that we can have a future, um, future um, resources for future uh, generations while uh, while keeping our climate temperatures and the balance of the whole uh, biogeochemical um, processes of planet Earth. So to do so, uh, the latest attempt, next slide, yes, thank you, Heidi, <laughs> is, uh, is uh, to bring the economy inside the safe operating space. It's the farm to fork strategy, as we all know, the heart of the European Green Deal. It aims to accelerate our transition into sustainable food systems that, uh, and we need to remember that, that have neutral or positive environmental impacts that helps mitigate climate change and reverses biodiversity loss. So restores and regenerates uh, the balances, uh, getting the economy inside uh, the ecological ceiling, the food system inside uh, the ecological ceiling. And if we only look at the food system, we just heard yesterday new numbers, I think the footprint of the Danish diet keeps on increasing. But anyways, we are right now at an unsustainable impact level of our food system. So if we look at the, you could call it personal boundary allowance for, for each of us, we have exceeded that. The, the Eat Lancet uh, report, um, 10 billion people, 2050, we heard it earlier, um, requires that we lower our footprint uh, of our food intake. So that means changing the production system and the consumption, the consumer, uh, the, the way we consume food. So right now we are somewhere between 0 0.8 to 0.6 a ton of CO2 equivalents per person per year. And we need to move towards this 0 0.5 ton uh, CO2 equivalents per person per year. So, so uh, in this aspect, um, there's two uh, Issues. There's, uh, of course, changing our diet, but another one is also to look into how we use lose uh, resources and emissions and how to change that part. So the next slide, please. So how do we how do we uh, change or how do we reduce the use of resources, energy, and and emissions? It's needed definitely, no matter if we look at animal, plant based, or hybrid. Um, food um, value chains. Um, so uh, changing our diets, we have heard, is not easy. So maybe precision fermentation offers an easy way of, of even going vegan without noticing. Um, so um, how, how, uh, how, how can we uh, design it, it, our food systems in the future, in my opinion, if we look into it, we need to look, you need to press three times, Heidi. We need to look into the whole value chain. We need to look at the energy system. We need to look at our upstream uh, resource use, but also the downstream uh, resources. So a whole system approach. But if we just look at the, the current system and I found a few, uh, next slide, a few um, research papers on the topic. There's not a lot out there, but of course, we all know and heard uh, from yesterday the new report from Concito, and in general, we know this that if we only focus on the carbon footprint, um, there seems to be an improvement when you move away from beef towards poultry, egg, light meat, plant based, and even uh, these novel uh, cell, cell, cellular or precision fermentation products. But it still depends on, on the feedstocks. So the upstream part, even upstream to to the um, to the strain development. Um, so what are the what are the feedstock and what are the 
side streams, or as we heard uh, from Michael, what are the uh, wave streams that we efficiently in these uh, delta waves, or what we should call them. But for sure, we can see here that it seems like land use impacts could be decreased or reduced from a transition into alternative uh, plant based, um, animal plant based, or even microbial proteins productions. For sure, there's also a significant uh, improvement in front of us. This is an emerging area, so technology development and also renewable energy sources would, and more sustainable carbon sources uh, could could improve even more uh, the individual production uh, value chain, be it animal, plant, or fermentation types. Carbon footprint of beef and milk proteins can be reduced uh, also. Um, I will show you that in a couple of slides, uh, and you probably know, but there are several ways of changing or correcting our food system. Um, so um, let's move um, to the next slide. So here is a study from uh, New Zealand, a research group uh, looking into um, uh, available studies and creating 16 uh, scenarios, a uh, theoretical, life cycle assessment based on best available knowledge, but here you see a sensitivity analysis where we compare, compare where they compared um, a conventional and precision fermentation uh, milk proteins. And one thing we can see is that based on the location of the country and the energy mix in that country, which is represented by the yellow contributions, uh, the footprint can be improved uh, or minimized a, a lot. New Zealand is here the, the best case between the locations. And the other thing that is a hotspot is uh, the carbon source <clears throat> for this uh, production system. Um, then there's the question of US or European Union. We heard it earlier today as well, regulatory barriers. Can we actually use the side stream or not? Is it a waste or is it a byproduct? Um, but uh, the red uh, vertical line you see here represents uh, <clears throat> conventional milk pro protein production in New Zealand. So I would say it's uh, it's not that obvious based on this study and the former slide uh, that uh, precision fermentation is uh, significantly mm, overperforming compared to existing systems. And so maybe we need to. Um, to, um, to, to, to look where we can um, improve the system. So um, moving to a systems approach, and this is not precision fermentation at all. This is a study which is finished on, uh, on the production, on the potential production of micro and macro uh, on land in, on land-based emission sources. So uh, emissions and side streams uh, from uh, industries, um, and in this study, if we move to European scale, uh, what we saw was that there's actually a huge potential for um, emission capture, both from liquid and um, and uh, point source air emissions. And using these algae feeds as a, as a feed supplement, they have also some potentials. We have seen that in the in the literature as well. So it's just to say. Um, there's probably many solutions, and it's it, it's definitely worth looking into the different solutions and 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 to to uh, acknowledge that um, it's probably a mix, and it is probably also uh, worth looking into local uh, characteristics, local industrial profiles, opportunities for local symbiosis. So if you can move to the next slide. So <clears throat> I would say that we need economic models uh, with circular resource flows. We need uh, industrial symbiosis um, uh, to play a role. We need to look at the byproducts, waste and emissions as feedstocks. Uh, in the study I showed you uh, on, the, on, on the New Zealand uh, studies, the, uh, the carbon source was uh, sugar beet, sugar cane. So um, we probably need to, to disconnect from, from the primary sector for the precision fermentation technologies for it to be improved. Um, yeah, so try to move to the next slide again. 
uh, there's a huge uh, opportunity for tapping into the food supply chain um, as, can you press once more, Heidi? Yeah, thank you. Um, as uh, we already have a significant amount of overproduction, so we also really need to keep that in mind. Uh, somehow food supply chain and the food systems needs uh, resiliency. Uh, and resiliency and sustainability of the food supply chain is, is kind of intertwined as well. So maybe some of this overproduction could actually be processed by different fermentation technologies and transformed into uh, food reserves. So maybe longer shelf life ingredients and products. Um, there should be some opportunities here, but as you can see, um, these numbers are quite high and we would actually talking about feed feeding um, all people on planet Earth also in 2050 have enough if, if we didn't have this huge amount of, of food loss and waste along the food supply chain. So again, a system approach, tapping into unexploited resources. Next slide, closing the, the loop along the food and supply chain, thereby contributing to, to rescuing um, our production of surplus foods from, from being um, lost uh, to food waste. So talking about the different I mean, uh, fermentation technologies that um, that um, Charlotte mentioned just before, um, I would say that uh, we have to respect the sustainability criteria and, and, and take care not to create an emission intensive new industry. So, uh, so, so the green areas here are removed uh, some of the details are a surplus food should not be downsided and and uh, they should stay food. So I would say maybe here biomass fermentation or similar uh, technologies uh, or for increased uh, preservation of these surplus foods would be ideal. But um, if you if you have food surplus food that have lost its nutritional value or somehow even inedible parts of, of the side streams, the yellow um, uh, circles or loops and the yellow angle uh, or arrow, this is where I think there is a, a huge potential to to um, to improve the food system. So is it possible to upcycle the uh, side streams that, uh, um, that are no longer suitable for, for reuse or, or, or food waste prevention, then that would be um, improving um, the, the, the performance of the whole food system. Uh, next, next slide, please. So I would say um, it's uh, it's been a steep learning curve even for me to look into all of this uh, mimicry. We talked about mimicking. So one thing I think is mimicking at the molecular level is is can probably do a lot of things, uh, but we also need to mimic at a system level. So we need to interact with uh, and, and exchange resources with the natural environment in a way that we can restore the planetary boundaries. Um, and we have heard that the, the spent microbial biomass is huge from Michael. So what to do with this, that is the downstream part, the yellow, uh, or the red mark text, as you can see, that is definitely a hotspot and it, uh, it's, it's whether you can use this or not in a safe way is, is a big question. The upstream part, I would say, and also I think for precision fermentation, it's only liquid and gas fermentation that, that could be useful. But um, looking really at which types of feedstocks do we actually have a, a biorefinery before? Do we have one after? Michael also mentioned that with the microalgae. So where do we tap into this uh, the food system, how do we create sustainable circles? How do we uh, um, um, create scales that fits an industrial ecosystem uh, in which uh, we move towards zero waste? Um, but of course, uh, next slide, if uh, at the moment um, these uh, spent microbial biomasses cannot be reused due to, to the engineered aspects of, of programmed uh, issues, 
then I would say in general, no matter what, the total process emissions you have on the left, uh, in the gray area, uh, has a lot of contributions, a lot, a lot of input parameters to the life cycle assessment. The challenge, I would say, is not uh, only to produce uh, and become more effective, but also where can you assimilate waste emissions and where can, what can be used as a carbon source? Um, how do you contribute to avoided emissions? So what do you substitute? So if the spent microbial biomasses cannot be used uh, uh, for food production, maybe they could at least be used for a local energy supply. And I would say something like biochar, if, the, if there's any concerns about uh, emission of, of a modified um, material that could interfere with soil microbes, or water quality, or whatever, uh, there may be some technology where at least uh, you could contribute to, we could contribute to soil carbon sequestration, maybe. And then uh, if there's some functionalities, like with the microalgae I showed before, where you actually can change something else in our production system, like with the enteric fermentation of livestock production, or other things, uh, reforestation, uh, closer to consumers, we have heard from precision fermentation, so less transportation. Uh, these things together is actually uh, the multi-scale uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and locations and, and design of the whole system where we should look. Um, so I would say in my last slide, uh, when we develop all of these fancy, nice tasting foods, which is very nice, and solves many problems, uh, for sure. I think we need to keep in mind that the uh, first thing is that we need to design these production systems for restoring the planetary boundaries. So regenerative circular food systems, biosolutions where resource flows and technologies are designed in a way to contribute down that road would be important. So I would say, instead of only looking at single target compounds, isolates from, uh, engineered host organism, look at the system value, look at the non-financial profits uh, that you can provide. And of course, we need decision support from these life cycle assessments and techno-economic assessments for businesses and policymakers. So that would be my end word. Thank you so much, Marianne, and uh, thank you for complimenting uh, so well what uh, Anna Christine brought to the table also and bringing it up to a, a global perspective of how the food system can operate, even with suggestions on how we could move ahead. We will pick up that uh, in the discussion session. Thank you so much for that. In our preparations for today and figuring out who should be the speakers, um, I was in hard search for somebody who could actually give us uh, insight into life cycle assessment of uh, precision fermentation with a speci special focus on dairy proteins. And it is so hard to find somebody who can even come close to it. But uh, when I called um, DTU, uh, I was lucky to get in touch with Nikolai Ovsianyak, who will now um, uh, introduce some of uh, uh, the ways you work uh, of, on life cycle assessment uh, specifically within the uh, area similar to this. Mikulau, you are a senior researcher at the Department of Environmental and Resource Engineering at DTU, and you focus on qualitative sustainability, quality assessment, as well as life cycle assessment, both from a methods perspective and from an application perspective. So you actually work both in practice and in theory, and we like that very much. I will see if I can um, find your presentation and uh, jump into it so that you can, uh, with your own words, introduce us to the science you are working with. And here we go. Um, I'll hand over the control to you. And in case you prefer that I click through your slides, we can change it. But it Thank should you. be close. Thank you very much, Heidi. How do I move forward or backward? Do I just press the arrows or? You click once and then you use either the arrows or your mouse. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to present the results of a sort of a screening exercise that I have carried out at DTU together with, uh, with Michael Hauschel and Peter Fantke. 
uh, in preparation for a bigger proposal, actually. And um, what we assess, well, we assess sustainability, environmental sustainability potentials of precision fermentation. And so when we say the potentials, we, we mean, well, does it matter that precision fermentation is perhaps better than a regular way of producing food? Does it really matter for how much we have to improve to be considered sustainable? Mariana has already uh, uh, highlighted the relevance of looking into planetary boundaries and carrying capacities of the planet. And this is what this presentation is about. So I will have an illustrative example how we can do it in practice. Uh, I should say before I jump into results that um, there are many unknowns that uh, that about precision fermentation, mainly model parameters that we simply did not have access to. So one of the key assumptions that we've made is that we assess the, the precision fermentation, assuming that the technology is relatively mature uh, and that the comparison with conventional way of producing protein is is fair. So for example, we did not use 5% yield that could perhaps be relevant today, but we assume a significantly higher yield, something that could be seen as being in within realistic range of values. Uh, so the results you will see, they probably do not represent how the technology could look today, but maybe how it could look in the future if we research on it and optimize and improve on it, uh, both from the technology, economy, those environmental perspective. So, <clears throat> so the starting point is of course, a system thinking, system perspective. So if you want the bovine protein produced from precision fermentation to replace beef, we need to look into the beef system as well and see, well, how do we get the meat from cattle beef today? Uh, as opposed to what we are going to do when we introduce precision fermentation to produce produce what I will call meat again, even though it, it might not be truly meat, but I will use this term. So uh, the conventional way would of course be to produce feed for production of cattle. And that includes many activities uh, in, in, in agriculture and, and so on. We would need to process the meat, uh, do something with co-products like leather and so on, and, and finally deliver that to consumers. So in the precision fermentation system, while well, there are some activities highlighted yellow that are somewhat new or new for this type of system, for this type of uh, product. Uh, well, we also need a feedstock, could be sugar cane, uh, delivering sucrose that has to be extracted, hydrolyzed to deliver monosaccharides, which could be seen as conventional feedstock for, uh, for the fermenting microorganisms. Uh, Perhaps the way of getting the meat would be slightly different. So there could be some differences in how we formulate the actual product. Uh, we would perhaps deliver some alternatives to the leather, could be made from plastic if, if we want the two systems to be truly comparable. And we could assume in this example that the retail system is, is, is the same. So this is, this is the system thinking. And of course, the starting point for the evaluation is, is, is carrying out um, a life cycle assessment. Uh, so what we did, we did a simplified LCA. Uh, this is a very rough sketch of system boundaries. What we consider, we consider feedstock production, uh, production of the feedstock, extractions, purification, hydrolysis of the sugars, uh, precision fermentation and treatment of wastewater. <clears throat> and the, the reason it's simplified is that there are several uh, assumptions that we had to make and uh, we consider the key activities. Uh, in the life cycle assessment. <clears throat> so what we get out of this exercise, and I come back to which, which data we actually use so we can have a, a chance to see. Uh, so result of this exercise is that the meat from precision fermentation has significantly lower carbon footprint compared to the meat from cattle beef. So 0.5 kilograms CO2 equivalent per kilogram of the product as opposed to 100 kilograms. So this is where LCA would typically stop. You would conclude, well, one is better than another with all the assumptions that you can discuss. This is, this is where LCA practitioner would typically stop and say, yeah, it's more sustainable. Or often they would say, oh, it is sustainable because it's better. Uh, <clears throat> but what we want to say is whether this difference actually matters for our efforts that we have to make to live in sustainable world. <clears throat> 
So we do something referred to as materiality assessment. It's not about materials, it's about whether it matters. Hmm. Uh, Mariana has already indicated that if we consider that we want to live in a world within planetary boundary for climate change in this case, uh, an average person living in this world should emit not more than roughly half a ton of kilogram of CO2 equivalent per year. So this is our this is our capacity. This is where we should not exceed. So what does it mean for the precision fermentation then? Well, we know that the current Danish per capita impact is 14 tons of kilogram of 14 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. And with the current consumption of 42 kilograms of beef per year. Uh, we can save about four tons of kilograms, of, four tons of CO2 equivalent per year, and this means that this is this is equivalent to 30% of the needed reduction <clears throat> to be sustainable from a climate perspective. Uh, you should not see these results as definite, as I say. There are several assumptions we had to make, but I, but I would like you to get is an idea of how these types of assessments can actually be done. Uh, some of the major assumptions that we had to do, they highlighted yellow, the yield of the meat, the plant lifetimes capacities, we had to assume use of water, electricity, uh, the wastewater output, well, we didn't have any details of the composition of the wastewater, the actual amount. So that's certainly something we could improve if we were to redo the exercise revisit the model and see whether 30% is still within range or whether it's smaller or higher. Uh, we have only looked at climate because this is illustrative exercise. This is, this is the first screening. There are other ecological limits, more tricky to define, less straightforward resources, pollution, biodiversity. We should not forget about them. Um, we should include them in the assessments, but uh, but we haven't done that. We are not there yet with uh, with precision fermentation. So I'm not sure if I answered Mikkel's question from the beginning. What about wastewater? We would have to do uh, several iterations to, and have better data to assess uh, performance uh, properly. But I think our screening exercise shows that uh, there is some potential that we should perhaps not ignore. Of course, we choose convenient product comparison with beef. Beef is, is one of the top contributors in terms of the climate impacts from food. Uh, we don't know how it's going to look for milk and other other products, but but these are all interesting questions that uh, would be nice to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mikulai. Uh, indeed, it seems you have to make some uh, clear cuts whenever you are uh, introducing a new LCA and make some decisions on what you count and what you don't count. Thank you so much for giving us some, uh, some knowledge about this. Now, it seems that all three of the scientists are suggesting to really take a deeper look at the side streams from existing production. And uh, I don't know if you have some specific questions, uh, Michael. Maybe I should start uh, handing over the microphone to you and see if you have specific questions to the three scientists. Unfortunately, uh, our time is quite short. It seems we only have a couple of minutes to discuss. Um, but so I think the most important ones must be your questions, Michael. Probably it's not a question, more a reflection. I think it is coming very close to what we see because what I really understand talking both with Anke Steed, Marianne and Mikola, is that we need more research. Frankly speaking, we need more research and we see the potential going into the field, but we're missing some building block. Uh, even though we see really that probably there are things that we should look into, and I really believe that will be one part of the solution in the future. Uh, but the most obvious for me when I looked into that is that we need more research. That is my conclusion when listen to for, for this one actually. It is uh, so so yeah, probably have lots of questions, but we then we need to go more in detail. How should we do it together, more or less like that? That kind of research. Any comments to that from the three speakers? I would like to comment on this. Uh 
Yeah, I think you, you call it research, we call it data and, and offer, you know, research is to produce data. I think we also need smart ways of generating data in the absence of all the years uh, that we need to devote to generate, you know, measured data. So, for example, consideration of the learning effects and upscaling effects in LCA as in, in the fancy, there are some approaches to to specific sectors, specific technologies, but there is no generic method that is probably applicable that could be, could be applied in this case. We, we're working on developing such, but it's, it's, it's not without challenges. Uh, so there is also research to be done in our field to figure out how this could be done, maybe to assist you guys and inform you what it is we need from you uh, because we will never have all the data we need. We need to be smart and identify what it is. And I would imagine the uh, data on the yields would be probably critical. Uh, data on uh, the feedstocks, what are the actual feedstocks? There's plenty of LCAs done on the feedstocks, so bio-based, what have you, that could be readily used to support this kind of screenings. But, uh, but I would imagine information about the yields, the processes and the efficiencies that would be the most important at this point, at least. And Christine, thank you, Nicolai. Yeah, I think uh, definitely uh, agree with uh, Nicolai. But and then also, of course, keeping in mind what we just heard in the last session about the the taste and the texture and, and these things. So, so there's definitely a lot of things to keep in mind when doing the uh, the optimization because we both have the the raw materials, the the waste in the end, and the product that we are aiming for, including all the things that. Uh, Mikael said so. Um, yeah, so um, I think we have the some work cut out for us there for the next future. Uh, yeah, for the future. I think. Uh, thank you so much. Um, actually, time is almost up, and I have a couple of slides I wish to share as well. But it seems that we, you, and I, and we all together, and the people in this room, have a lot of work to keep doing perhaps also looking at how can we mimic uh, nature in terms of the symbiosis that you suggest, Marianne. I don't know if we can make it completely um, agnostic to how economic uh, interests uh, may uh, impact the ideas, but uh, looking into um, systemics approach and the symbiosis as a suggestion, uh, it's definitely something that um, that all of us could probably contribute to. And uh, any comment? If I, if I may, I think that that, that we really need a distance uh, approach to be acknowledged. So so uh, so somehow we need uh, the profit for for the environment and biodiversity in societies to to be in competition with the economic profit optimization. So if you are measured on a system level, I think that would be a nice motivation for companies. Uh, but then the system level performance would need to be acknowledged. So if you can be climate neutral in a symbiosis, that would need to be uh, acknowledged somehow. Um, I think that's that that is really just as important as uh, as the the yield, as Michael mentioned, the the, the system uh, the systems the level sustainability and scale is important, really important. Thank you so much. This will be the final word, uh, and I hope that at some point we will make some politicians listen in on the challenges we are meeting here. Um, but for now, uh, I'm really grateful for your input the, both of the question and the interest uh, in this area michael and uh, for you and christine and marianne and nikolai for bringing uh, your science uh, into the discussions here thank you so much and actually i think uh, now i have one minute to uh, thank all of the speakers that have joined in today and all the audience just before you leave uh, i would like to um, remind you uh, that we are a cluster organization that actually do a lot of uh, activities every year so that you can meet each other, uh, find the finance you need for uh, materializing your ideas, maybe even blueprint them. One of the upcoming opportunities that is an international event is uh, our uh, Food and Bio um, 
Global Summit, which takes place in Aarhus in the end of September. And you can use your phones again if you want to check out the program or sign up for it. It will be a great event in which we will be focusing on some of the aspects discussed here today as well, with four uh, engaging uh, labs in which you can engage with the knowledge you have in order to move ahead within your agenda. Check out the program online. Um, also, you can always find, I'll see if I can, if it's clicking now. I'm not even in control of my own slides. Here we go. Um, you can always check out uh, if there are open calls that you need to have a, keep an eye on. Unfortunately, the call plant to food, which is uh, for research, does not allow for GMO. So I think this is perhaps not the option for looking into uh, too much uh, precision fermentation as per se, but perhaps some of the feedstocks that we're working with could be um, uh, of interest to look into. There are other programs and we keep opening up programs for you to for soft funding for collaborating and for developing your projects. If you are a company and you want to, uh, you are much in, more interested in, uh, in other types of uh, changes in your company, you can always check out the Wirksomhus guide in which you can uh, get some both ideas and funding for your uh, transitions on IT or green transition. And finally, just to remind you, you can always find an event that fits your interest uh, in our calendars. Thank you so much to all of you. And thank you so much to the Ministry of Higher Education and Science, without whom today would not have been possible. <laughs>